welcome back to the Data Science Hangout, everyone. If you're joining for the first time, it's great to meet you. I'm Rachel, I'm the host of the Data Science Hangout. Um, as I mentioned at the meetup yesterday, if you were there, I do wanna take a moment to say, it's nice to be able to share some space with everyone right now. What we do at our studio is only made possible because of the community. And we're all beneficiaries of so many amazing community members many of whom are affected by the war in Ukraine right now. So we also want to use this opportunity to support them back in any way that we can. And so Sepp and Virla, who you may know from the Data Science Hangout, had shared a few ways on LinkedIn, which we can all help, um, that I'll share in the chat. But if you do have other information to share, please feel free to do so in the chat as well. But thank you, everyone. And for anybody joining for the first time, the Data Science Hangout is an open space for the whole data science community to connect and chat about data science leadership, questions you're facing, and, and what's really going on in the world of data science. So we really want this to be a space where everybody can participate and we can hear from everyone. So there's three ways to ask questions. You can always jump in live and maybe raise your hand on Zoom might be the best way to do that. You can put questions in the Zoom chat and just put a little star next to it if you want me to read it um, or else I can just call on you to bring into the conversation too. And then lastly, we do also have a Slido link where you can ask questions anonymously too. And Rob will share that in the chat in just a moment. Just like to reiterate, we love to hear from everyone no matter your level of experience or area of work too. Um, but for today, I'm so happy to be joined by my co-host, Stephen Bailey. Steven's a data engineer at Whatnot. And Steven, I'd love to turn it over to you to introduce yourself and maybe share a bit about the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here today. Um, I can, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my story over the last like five years or so um, and kind of where I'm at now. Um, I, I, my data journey kind of started uh, as a PhD student um, doing biomedical image analysis at Vanderbilt University. My PhD was on like this cool uh, mix of uh, MRI images of the brain and cognitive development and children like educational pedagogy with, with reading. And so essentially what we did was we brought kids in every summer and took brain scans of them and then looked at how their brains changed and interactions between brain areas changed as they learned to read and like become fluent in, um, in decoding and, and reading comprehension. It's really fun. Uh, we got to do like a lot of data engineering and processing and basically learn everything from the ground up. Uh, statistics, like the whole data science, you know, workflow. And um, towards the end of that program, I decided I wanted to go more into industry rather than sticking with academia because I just love the process so much. Um, I'd never, when it got like, by the time a project got to the poster session and I was like explaining things, I was kind of like already tinkering on the next thing. So um, industry was a great fit. I started at a company called Amuda, which is a uh, kind of a data catalog company that's very focused on compliance related um, functionality. So for example, if you load data into your data warehouse and it has PII on it, a lot of times you want to protect that data from or, or apply permissions and policies on it so that only certain people can see it. Um, and so Amuda kind of automated that. So I got to build out the data team there. I got to learn a lot about data management, a lot about metadata management. Um, and just recently this year, I, I uh, went from a director position there, managing a team of about four or five people, to a individual contributor position at a company called Whatnot, which is kind of like QVC meets eBay. So people can hop on the app and sell stuff, um, you know, especially collectibles like trading cards, sports cards, um, vinyl records, vintage clothing, um, and they can kind of build a following. And um, uh, yeah, so it's a really interesting, it's a very interesting mix of like, social networking, uh, real-time auctions, live stream, you know, live stream data. And I'm running the data platform there, or at least managing sort of the engineering aspect of it. So it's been uh, very much a drinking by the fire hose experience, uh, but it's been really awesome to, to start learning. Awesome, thanks, Steven. I know on these chats a lot, we, we talk about what it's like to move into leadership or move into like the first management of data science um, role, but what has it been like to go 
kind of the other way back to being an individual contributor? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, I don't know how, like what the real percentage of, you know, data professionals who go into management and then come back into individual contributors is like, I don't know what that looks like, but I, I know anecdotally, uh, a lot of people do make that switch because, um, I think for two reasons, one is uh, a lot of us get into data and kind of like very organically move into positions of influence within the organization simply because we love answering questions and we love like getting close to the business problem and like trying to use data to, to improve it. And so it kind of naturally, I know with, for me at Amuta, I kind of naturally moved into a position where um, we were growing, we needed more people to focus on it. And I was like situated to lead that team. So it was a very, it wasn't like a, you know, I want to go and be a manager um, type of experience. It was very organic. And so uh, as you, as I spent more time in that role, I learned a ton, but I also like missed the data side because being a, like an individual contributor right now is just so fun. I mean, you just get to play with so many cool tools, the, the sort of the opportunities and possibilities of building different data products is endless. It's getting easier every, like every month. Um, and so that's really what I, you know, that's what motivated me to move back into the, the data engineering role is just, um, just that opportunity to like build, build bigger, cooler, more interesting systems that I hadn't done before. Cool. To put us all maybe in like the mindset of the work that you do at whatnot, I'm I'm curious, what are some of the like business problems that you're helping solve? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think whatnot is really exciting um, because it's a it's a peer to peer marketplace, kind of like you know an Uber where you've got a driver and you've got a passenger, and and the app is really like facilitating a transaction between them. So the same is true for us, where you've got a seller with Pokemon cards, you've got a buyer who wants to buy Pokemon cards, and we have to put them together um, at the same time, like in real time, so that they can have a transaction take place. Um, so what is really exciting at Whatnot is the focus on real time analytics and real time data. Um, I'm very much a, a person who's, I come from a world where it's like big batches, big batch processing, like with medical imaging. And then even with like a lot of business data, it's not, it doesn't need to be that fast. Um, because, you know, as long as the report's there at, in the morning, like everyone can kind of do their jobs. But at Whatnot, because the, because things move so fast, the, the ability to implement real-time systems is actually very important. Because if someone's in an auction and selling something that's valued at $5,000, you know, a lot of people want to go see that. And the auction is going to be over in 30 seconds to 60 seconds because it's literally like, you know, here's this designer iPhone that Steve Jobs, uh, you know, owned. And, uh, you know, and then it's like starting at $1 and it's boom, 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 up to, you know, $5,000 or whatever. So the speed at which things are moving is really interesting, uh, really like a challenging technical problem to answer, but there's so much opportunity for building interesting like insights off of it and systems. That's awesome. I see Seb, you're, uh, you just wrote in on the chat. Do you want to jump in and ask that question? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for uh, taking the time to answer everybody's questions and, and share your story. Um, you mentioned cool tools that you, uh, that you're playing with. I want to see if there were some on top of your mind. Yeah. Um, so, you know, kind of in the same vein of the real-time analytics conversation, there's, um, there's kind of a whole host of new databases that are becoming more popular that allow you to um, build, build like streaming pipelines much easier than you normally would. So I don't, uh, this whole space is fairly new to me, but I think in the past, if you wanted to like stream data from an application, and then consume it by for an analytics application, you would have to set up like a Kafka, uh, a whole Kafka event bus, and you'd have to have like an analytic, like a sort of a streaming, uh, very like tuned streaming system. So there's like Kafka SQL analytics and other things like that. But now um, tools like Rockset and Materialize and time, I think TimescaleDB 
are, are trying to make it much easier to just write SQL on top of these systems. And so as once you set up the pipe um, from your event source, uh, whether that's clickstream data or whatever, <clears throat> you can just write SQL queries on it and then expose those to, um, to applications. And you know, basically you have a very, uh, a much lighter weight way to, to make recommend, like to implement like recommendation systems or ranking systems or um, even like payment process like payment analysis systems. So fraud detection is like a big question that we're a big issue that we're trying to um, focus on. And I think data like the data team has a, a big opportunity to help like influence make that easier. So definitely those real time, the real time stuff um, is important, is, is really cool. Uh, the other tool that I just love working with is um, DBT, which is like a data management tool. Um, and they have some new functionality out around what's called a metrics layer, um, which is basically a way to uh, simplify the creation of like metrics and, and kind of govern metrics. Um, Kind of within the database logic. Oh, thanks, Stephen. Robert, I see you just asked a question in the chat too, if you want to jump in. Yeah. Hey there. Uh, thanks for doing this. Yeah. Um, I work at I work at our studio. Uh, so I was I was curious if you could clarify what um, the difference between a data engineer and a, a data scientist in, in your eyes, because I see that you're currently a your title is data engineer, but previously it was a uh, data and analytics. Yeah, yeah. I've I feel like I've kind of been <clears throat> all over the map uh, from a title perspective. Um, I think my training in the PhD program was very much like you kind of get trained to be an independent investigator, and that that means like. You're designing the experiment, you're collecting the data, you're processing the data, you're storing it somewhere for reuse, you're analyzing it, you're creating the images, and then you're also like presenting it. So you get this full life cycle. And um, I think the same is fairly true of, of the business, except there's, there's this like fulcrum in the middle around the database. And so like where the data is stored. And so I would say the um, the data engineering side of things, I think of more as designing data models, making like like ingesting data from different sources across the company, making sure that those pipelines are running efficiently and reliably and really building trust in the raw data or like the, and the slightly like lightly processed data. Whereas the data scientist, I think of as much more um, like, pointed towards a problem area. So the, the engineer, I think of as systems, a systems thinker, where it's like, we're bringing in data, we wanna make it reusable for a large number of applications. Whereas a data scientist is very much like, I need to solve a problem. I need to create a, you know, an a specific application that's going to like, or a specific model that's gonna be deployed to make decisions. So I think of it um, a little bit in those terms. So systems thinking and um, and like data ingestion, collection, reliability versus, um, you know, solving a business problem, building something that's generalizable, um, you know, building a model that's generalizable for a solution, that, that type of um, thinking. For uh, two just sort of quick follow-ups to that, are there, is there a lot of overlap in tools for data engineering versus science, and then is there a is there a clear path sort of into leadership or higher level roles for data engineering today? It's a I guess a newish uh, newish field or title. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it, with my data engine, like with my data engineering hat, I. I see a much clearer like relationship or I feel a much more like closer kinship with the infrastructure and DevOps and software engine engineering teams um, at whatnot. So, you know, I'm working in, I'm building stuff out in AWS. I'm setting up like 
monitoring and logging and I'm managing some network, um, you know, networking type of stuff. And that has a lot of overlap with stuff that um, site reliability engineers and other infrastructure minded people um, are focused on. And so I do see a, like a career ladder that, that looks similar to a, like an engineering career ladder. I think, and that might, I mean, it depends on the, I guess it really depends on the industry from a data science perspective, but I do think there's, if you have like a data science organization, like there's a, a clear career ladder in that. Um, but like at Amuta, I don't think there was a very clear career ladder for the data science people. Like I think the data engineering side could, could kind of go up that infrastructure ladder, but then the data science, it was almost like you had to go into the business um, to grow. I don't know. Does that answer your question? It, it does. Yeah. Thank you. I feel, I feel like we're all learning, uh, <laughs> learning as we go with, with what the career trajectory looks like. Definitely. Meredith, I see you have your hand raised if you want to jump in. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks, Stephen, for your presentation and answering our questions. I, I love how you frame data engineering versus data science, not so much by the task, but by the big picture of, you know, the kind of thinking that, that one does when they're in one position or another. I've heard a number of people talk about being really excited about DBT and liking working with it. Um, can you recommend, so I've got two questions. The first one is, what do you recommend for how to learn DBT um, or get more exposure to it. And then the second one is that, so I'm, I'm a career changer and I am really interested in data analytics as it relates to health. And so um, to watch your career tra trajectory of starting out working with biomedical imaging and then shifting out into other things, I'm really curious for you, um, what had meaning for you as it relates to that work and did it lose its meaning or like kind of how your how meaning has been part of your career, career trajectory oh man that's a great question um okay let me start with the first part which is about dbt so what i found um you know so my background was a scientist right like experiment and then I'm taking that experiment to the end, to the conclusion, like, what did we learn from this? And it's like very project-based. When I moved to Amuda, I started off and I was a data scientist and I like had those projects. It's like, all right, how's our product perform under these circumstances? Run an experiment, present the results, like done. When I started building out the internal team and the data platform, it's a very different kind of task because you're building out an organization, an organizational capability, which is the data platform. So it's not a project. It becomes a system that you're building. And I was not equipped at all <laughs> to answer, like to understand how to build a system that's going to be very reusable um, for the company over time. Because if you build it wrong, that means in a year or two years, you're going to have to go through and like refactor all this stuff. And so you really want to build it right at the beginning. What DBT does is the whole, the whole shtick is basically like decoupling the, in, the pulling in of data with the using of data. So DBT basically says, all right, you've got data in your database. You want to do like, you want to build a dashboard over here, put all of the logic in SQL and put it in your database. And it, it basically um, allows you to, it, it makes it very easy to do that. And it's got some like, the the way it does it, it's like very heavily, nicely managed for you. It makes it very easy for even someone who's very new to like database management to, to do it the right way um, right off the bat. And, and so it made me much more, um, so first of all, it let me build a system that was not terrible uh, right away. And then secondly, it helped me to, um, and the team improve the system and build conventions over time. And because it's all in version control, it's in GitHub, um, it, as we added more people to the team, they could go back and look at like what's happening. They could submit pull requests and we could have conversations over new data models that are coming in and, and things like that. So um, it kind of, you get the first win out of just like 
it helps you do things the right way early on. And the second win is it creates a channel for communication and collaboration that is um, really hard to, to create if you're not using something like GitHub. So that's why I'm a huge DBT fan. Um, but your second question about the like kind of the domain question and healthcare and, and all that stuff is, is also great. Um, for me, I'm a huge, like for me, I get a lot of reward out of doing things that make like, that I can see an impact on the way people work or like, like the personal sort of like of collaborating with people. And so the types of um, things that I really enjoyed at Amuta were when I could sit down with a business stakeholder and, and like say like, hey, like what's your problem and really understand like the sorts of tedious tasks that they're doing that we could automate. Um, I could build like, oftentimes it's pretty easy for a data person to build something that's going to you know, automatically pull those numbers and, and sort them in the right way that's gonna help them help a business user um, do actions better. And so I found a lot of value out of that um, in my career in industry. At Whatnot, I'm kind of doing similar things where I can build pipes and build systems that make it easier for us to understand our customers or, or you know, build workflows that are more efficient. But I do miss, I do miss the domain, like the healthcare domain, the image processing stuff, thinking about um, the sort of bigger picture of science and general generalization. Um, I think it's offset a little bit though, because the data world is so deep and so the technology is always changing. There's a lot of um, you know, conversations around what's the best way to do this or like what's the best way to organize the teams and, and all of this stuff. So I, I find that even though I miss some of the healthcare type of um, learning and, and thinking very deeply about specific problems, there's more than enough uh, exciting stuff for me to learn and, and dig into that, that keeps me satisfied. Thanks, Stephen. Ethan, I, I see you had also asked a question earlier in the chat too, and love to have you ask that one live. Or I can, I can read it too. And, and you can jump in and add more context if you want. Uh, but the question was, is there anywhere you see the application of zero knowledge proofs that help make working with PPI and ensure compliance easier? Ooh. And I'll admit, I don't not know what that means. So <laughs> feel free to jump in with more context too. Hi. Even. <laughs> Hi. Um, sorry, yeah. So zero knowledge proof is basically a, very, uh, a concept um, around cybersecurity where you can um, validate stuff without actually knowing um, the actual answers. So I was just wondering if there's any applications around personal data that help uh, making working with it easier because, you know, I'm in Europe and um, GDPR is quite a big thing over here. And, you know, there's a lot of concerns around uh, privacy. Yeah, are, are zero knowledge proofs, um, is that like, the same as homomorphic encryption, or is it like a category, like a um, concept around homomorphic encryption? Or is it separate? It's a, yeah, it's it's different. It's a concept around how do we. So basically, um, you can prove to the other persons that you know something without the other person um, actually knowing it. So, right. for example, if if you have a key, you can prove to the other person I have this key but the average yeah. person wouldn't know what the keys look like or, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so during, I can't speak too knowledgeably about this specific question. Um, I do have some experience with like implementing privacy, uh, privacy um, enhancing technologies in, in organizations. So at Amuta, we, the, the product, would scan a data warehouse for sensitive data and tag it. So like it would say, all right, this lo looks like you have social security numbers. It looks like you have addresses. It looks like you have names and things like that. And then there were a couple of um, approaches that we could automatically implement if you had a policy uh, that wanted to mitigate privacy concerns. The ones that we had were uh, masking uh, technology, 
uh, masking methods like hashing, redaction, replacement with string, uh, rounding, etc. We had one that was called k-anonymization, um, and we had one that was called differential privacy. So I think um, there's a whole other set of uh, methods like zero knowledge proofs, homomorphic encryption. Um, it's another one I'm, I can't I can't remember, but um, basically there's there's a number of technologies that that you can implement. What I'll say is that um, it's for a lot of organizations, just implementing like the basics is very very the basics at scale is very very challenging um, because you have to have a lot of um, you have to have a lot of metadata essentially a lot of high quality metadata to do privacy uh, to do privacy management very very well so you have to know like you have to have a language around what is sensitive data you have to have um, metadata on the data itself that says like this column is sensitive um, you have to have policies in place in your organization so you have to know like actually you actually have to have someone who's translating that into uh, an actionable policy of like we need to mask this type of data for these types of users you have to have high quality user data um, to know like who is accessible and in Europe you also have to have like this concept of projects and purposes uh, around like what is <laughs> for this person using this data uh, under these parameters like why are they using it and you have to manage all of that in one place um, so it's extremely challenging to get all those things right. I think what, what we found, like what we spent a lot of our time doing at Amuda was, was trying to help organizations build a language um, that, that would allow them to address those, those sorts of questions at scale, because I think that's, the, that's really the problem. Um, so all of that to say, I think we, what, what we found oftentimes was that people would come in and they'd say like, we wanna do differential privacy, which is essentially like randomizing, in, injecting randomization into the, your data set to, to provide a level of privacy guarantees. But then they'd always end up going down to like, let's just mask the data. Like, let's just mask the data and like get it, like get started using it rather than like trying to do the, the most private thing first off. I think, Individual research teams, however, individual teams that have like a very specific project they're, they're trying to do, they can have um, a lot more success with things like differential privacy, homomorphic encryption, and that type of stuff. So there's probably a lot of value for certain, for certain use cases that are very well-defined, um, you know. So that, that, that's kind of my, I don't know, my big picture thing, thought on that. Yeah. I think that's definitely one of the masking is definitely one of the future of um, data as you know privacy become more of an issues because client wouldn't even let us touch the data because it's too sensitive and you know in Europe you have to jump or sort of hoops to be able to work with personal data. Yeah, yeah, and it can be hard. Like something like that can be very useful, um, you know, especially for like. There, there's different phases of, of analytics, right? So there's like just knowing that someone else's data could be useful to you. Like that's where you want to have something like, like that zero knowledge proof where it's like, hey, can we even start on this question? Um, because you might not have the data that you need um, to actually do anything meaningful with. And, and, and if you can't see it at all, you can't know whether there's, it's worth pursuing. Arafath, I see you had clapped and then raised your hand. So I'm guessing you have something to add to this topic too. Uh, yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi Stephen, thanks. Uh, I've been loving this conversation and everything. The clap was about the conversation, but that was a mistake. <laughs> but I really appreciate the discussion. Uh, I actually wanted to ask you about uh, your transition from being a data scientist to data engineer. So how is the transition itself and um, what would be some of the things that you think um, that really helped you in your current job from your data science experience and what are the weaknesses or things that you had to learn immediately? The reason that I'm asking because a lot of times I get recruiters contacting me for data engineering kind of roles 
but I'm currently in data science area. So I'm trying to understand why and also why not kind of. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. So um, I think, So, so for me, I love the systems building part of, um, of data engineering. So I love being able to think big picture about like, what is the pattern? What are the patterns that we're implementing in these systems and how do we make them very high quality and efficient, like implement checks. Um, and so, and, and that was true even when I was doing my PhD, I often found myself like gravitating towards the methods and like rerunning pipelines uh and trying to make pipelines more efficient even when that probably wasn't the most the best thing for me to be doing I probably could have benefited from like doing more analysis or doing more research so i've i've always had sort of a system bent to me and uh, i would say that the challenge that becoming more of a data engineering role like moving more into a data engineering role has presented is you have to know a lot about like the technologies and you have to learn a lot of um, software engineering patterns that I was never taught. And so, you know, things like domain driven design and um, like testing, like how do you design a Python package? How do you um, implement good testing? How do you implement observability and like log tracing across multiple systems, networking, um, concerns, uh, that I'm uh, networking still, like I, <laughs> I learn it. And then like, I wake up the next morning and I, I for, have forgotten all of it. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of technology, like I would say the technology side of things is much more, um, important in, uh, in the data engineering world than it is on the data science side. I think I've, I think one thing that I bring to a data engineering role that I wouldn't have if I hadn't spent time as a data scientist is understanding use cases for data. Um, a lot of data engineers will will kind of, I, don't, I guess I don't wanna put this on a lot of data engineers, but like my impression is that I, if you are coming in just as a data engineer, you could silo yourself kind of like in the back end and just be like, laying down pipes and moving data from one place to another and kind of get stuck in that role. But a good data engineer, I think has a lot of leverage over helping the organization like get data, not just to places on the right time, but in the right way with the right metadata that makes it useful, like do some pre-processing of data to make it really easy for data scientists to um, to work on it. And so I think I bring a lot of that like context, like contextual information about how data is going to be used, which makes me better at building the systems for the, the, the users. Uh, I love, I mean, if you think you like it, it's, um, I mean, I think all of data is a great place to be right now, but data engineering in particular is a spectacular place to be because it's um, very, it's, it's evolving constantly. You can have a lot of impact in your organization, and there's just a ton of stuff to learn. A um, ton of very, mm -hmm. very interesting, exciting stuff to learn. Great, thanks. I see that kind of touched on your question as well, Naveed, but just wanted to see if you have any follow-up there too. Yeah, let me just unmute myself and show my show my face. Uh, so I work at Kaiser Permanente and lead the causal inference function at KP. And so I was just curious, I mean, as you know, DS is pretty wide. I mean, you can get into a lot of different areas in DS. Um, what part of DS did you end up leaving to get into data engineering? I wonder if, if, if it was conditional to that as well. Yeah. Um, so my PhD was in a lot of the, the engineering, a lot of the data science work was computer vision related. So, you know, we would get these four dimensional brain images where you've got like the brain, you know, a three dimensional brain block, but then it's like, it's changing over time and you'd have to register and normalize all this stuff and then run stats across um, both within the, the time series of the brain and then across subjects. And so it was computer vision plus like um, stats, like population stats, uh, ANOVAs and stuff like that. Um, when I went to Amuda, the data science was, it was really more data analytics than data science because we didn't have any, any um, 
sort of cutting edge use cases for things. It was more like, hey, we need to, un we need to model the business and have very reliable, trustworthy metrics around user behavior and sales performance and uh, all these different things. So I kind of went from what I would really call data science and, or even just science to mm -hmm. this data analytics now to more of a dedicated data engineering role. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I see there was an anonymous question asked earlier on Slido um, that was, if you had to choose, would you prefer being the first data science data scientists at a company or being part of an existing group of data scientists? And would the path to becoming a manager be different? That's a great question. Um, I think there's pros and cons. And you do have to ask yourself, like, I think a lot of self-knowledge comes into play here. For me, I like I like, I get super excited by learning new things and, and being able to build things. Um, I am like, you know, 98% of my excitement goes into the first like 80% of the project. And then I have 2% left for the last 20%. I'm like that kind of worker, which is not necessarily, the, <laughs> which is not the best kind of worker in, in a lot of contexts. Um, but it's great for startups because everything you do is new. Like, so if you want to stand up a database, no one is going to stand up a database for you. You have to learn, like go into Amazon and like pick your database and decide how you, how many nodes you want and like set up the networking and the security groups and stuff like that. So what's great about being the first data scientist at a company is you get to write the, you get to build the system, you get to understand, um, you get to chart the territory. You're like kind of like, you know, you're the pioneer um, charting the uncharted territory. So that's very, um, that can be very exciting for people. It can also be very overwhelming um, and lonely because you don't know if your decisions are going to be right. Um, you don't know if like you're going to have to <clears throat> rebuild the system in the future. You don't, you might not even know what you're doing really. <laughs> And when you, if you start learning like AWS and stuff, like you probably definitely won't know what, what you're doing for a while. Um, so I, I loved that when I left, uh, Amuda, I knew for sure that I wanted to join an existing data team because I wanted to learn from others. I think that's the, um, that's, that's one of the differences is, uh, if you're doing it, if you're charting your own course, there are great communities out there. There's great learning materials out there, but you're still going to be ultimately alone um, to some extent. I mean, you'll have business partners and stuff, but I knew I wanted to join an existing team um, because I wanted to learn from other people. I wanted to see what other people were doing, how they were doing it. What kind of dashboards were they building? What kind of conversations were they having? What like opportunities did they see? And it's been very, very rewarding to be in that sort of position um, for this at, at whatnot. So it's a, it's just like anything, it's just got trade-offs. I would say if you want to be the first data hire at a startup, um, go for it, but just make sure you know kind of what you're getting into um, and, and are prepared for that. Thanks, Stephen. That's great advice. I, um, I see Sloan, you had asked a question earlier about working with real-time data. Do you want to ask that one live? Hi, sure. Let me also turn my camera on. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that you went through, um, when you started at Whatnot, uh, working with real-time data in comparison to batch data in the past. And I'm curious what unique and specific challenges that you ran into when navigating that switch. Yeah, so, I mean, this is very much an active area of, um, of work for our company, uh, but it's a... Uh, what I would say is that the technical side of things matters a lot more. Um, with batch data, you can kind of, you know, just shove stuff into an S3 bucket or like, you know, not think too much about schedules or um, efficiency of processing and things like that. If you're trying to deliver um, real-time analytics to an application, uh, like a mobile application, there's almost no room for error. Like you have to be thinking because you're, you're trying to do it, whatever your SLA is, it might be five seconds, right? So you think like 
by the after you click a button, you know, that event has to go somewhere and then it has to have logic applied to it. Maybe it has to be joined with other data or a model has to run on it and then it has to be sent back to your mobile device. And if anything takes if it takes 20 seconds, like as a mobile user, that's an eternity. So um, the stakes are just so much higher because you are trying to, to do something much more, um, you know, that, that affects the user much, much more closely and is much more interactive. Um, so that's, um, that's one of the biggest shifts, I think, just from a sort of emotion, like almost like an emotional standpoint of like, people are going to be using this. This is going to affect the user experience. If this thing doesn't work, then like maybe a show doesn't show up on someone's feed. And that means that seller doesn't get featured as much, which changes like the seller's perception of the, um, of, you know, their experience on the app. Um, so it's, it's that sort of, um, prominence of the, uh, of the system that I think is really interesting. I see Ian had asked earlier, um, what's your opinion of R as a data engineering tool versus other languages like Python or C, for example? Um, I'm not a, uh, I'm not an expert in R. I used it during my, um, PhD a number of like for a number of uh, use cases. I love R shiny. I it R is like so much more elegant for uh, a lot of data science work than anything in Python. Like that's my after using after. I, but I made a deliberate switch to learn Python for two reasons. One was because a lot of my work was using image processing libraries that required me to do script like. Um, use things like OpenCV or um, what's the Python, uh, SciPy. There, there were just more libraries out there for image processing work. Um, so I, I focused a lot on Python there. As I've, um, and I've, I've, my sense is that there are more out of the box solutions for Python. Like it's much more of a lingua franca in the um, data engineering world than R is, um, just for like thinking about like what AWS provides, like AWS provides a, um, a CLI for Python, or not a CLI, but a library for Python users to interact with resources um, in AWS. May uh, maybe there's something like a Boto3 for R, I'm not sure. Um, but I would say that uh, outside of if like, to the extent that you have to do things outside of a like data management and processing flow, like um, like pull like ingest data, move data from a source system into a database, but not like doing the processing on the fly. My guess is that Python has a little bit more um, uh, more libraries out there, but I don't know. I, I guess that uh, um, I, I haven't I never evaluated R directly for um, data engineering use cases. So I'd be curious, I don't know if anyone else has thoughts on that. Um, that'd be a good one if anyone has any. Yeah, I see a few people sharing comments in the chat too, or libraries that don't exist or libraries that do exist to help <laughs> interact. So feel free to jump in. Um, I, uh, I, a few years ago, we had like this, I mean, to speak about startups and, and the wonderful world that they are. Um, it, uh, you know, sometimes things are like deadline, right? And it's like, okay, we need this two weeks. Uh, I certainly enjoy that. I think uh, I'm also come from a science background, so I don't mind kind of, you know, going into the unknown and kind of just iterating and learning as I go. And I think it's a wonderful learning opportunity for those that, that are interested. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there was a project that required like a two week turnaround. And first several days I was looking to grab data using R uh, and then interacting with AWS. And there was like one package, but it hadn't been updated in like several years and it just did not work whatsoever. Uh, and so I had to basically then revert into using uh, Boto3, but using Reticulate. So um, that way I can kind of coalesce the, the analytical stuff that was happening with kind of extracting and using Python uh, win for Reticulate. 
Um, obviously, you could do that in just Python and kind of connect it that way too. But um, but I haven't heard of pause, so maybe Ian would speak about that. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so uh, pause is more of like an SDK than like a, a really easy to use functional R library. But I have had a lot of success with interacting with uh, S3 Dynamo DB in particular. It's very easy to use through that package. Um, <clears throat> And I'm on the GitHub repo right now, and it looks like it was updated 12 days ago. So I think there is an active maintainer. That's too long ago, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to put that link in the chat too, Ian. Let me see what other questions we have here. I see Yusef, you had asked a question in the chat. Do you want to jump in? I can, I can read and you can add more context too if you want to. Um, yes, I, I just have a question. If, uh, what, 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 what the most uh, part of, uh, the most uh, consuming time part of uh, your job as a data engine? And what, what is the best uh, choose, uh, open source tools for you as a data engineer also? Thank you. Yeah, so one of the, I think one of the fundamental um, things that most data engineers are, are responsible for at some point, at some point is like the ingestion pipelines that, you know, either ETL or uh, ELT is kind of the new um, uh, pattern of just like extract and load. So replicate the data into your warehouse and then do the transformation in the warehouse or in the data lake. Um, so you spend a lot of time like building, setting that up. But there are some good tools out there now, I'd say in the last five years, tools like Fivetran, Stitch, um, Meltano, Airbyte is another one now um, that have essentially made it um, a commodity, like data replication, a commodity, where if you are using a standard uh, customer, what do they call them? CRM, customer relationship management system, um, usually there's a connector that's out there that you can just kind of plug and play and extract data into your warehouse and like uh, Fivetran has hundreds of connectors. And so those sorts of frameworks and tools make it, make the data engineer's job a lot easier from a um, engineering, like from a, um, movement perspective, but I'd say, I'd say there's still a considerable amount of time being spent there. Um, cause you can always continue to optimize it too. So one of the things we're talking about now, even outside of the real time system at whatnot is, how do we get more, um, how do we get data in quicker? How do we do more, like get our batch processing down from a 24 hour batch process down to a three hour batch process or a two hour thing. And so that sort of optimization of the system is something where I'm constantly thinking about um, as well as data reliability and testing and making sure like building guarantees around some of those core data assets that we have. Um, spend a lot of time thinking about that. The, one of the areas that I think is newer, um, I think something that is emerging in the data engineering world is the data engineer as, um, as not just a technical person, but as a systems builder and a systems thinker. Um, some larger organizations have data architects, but this sort of idea that we have like across the whole company, you have information flowing around and we need to be able to have a we want to avoid a situation where as the company grows, you start having all of these data silos and everyone's like getting their own sources of truth and like creating their own metrics and none of the metrics agree. The data engineer is really well positioned to think about like, how does data move throughout the organization? What sort of conventions do we want to put around uh, publishing data products? What sort of um, guarantees do we want to make? What kind of language do we want to use? What's, what compliance patterns do we need to implement to make sure that our data is being used uh, correctly? Um, so I think increasingly, I'm going to be thinking about those sorts of organizational decisions. Not, so not just the technical, but actually like the human organizational patterns that um, around data access and usage. Steven. I see Tatsu had a question as well. He said, as a fellow recovering academic, if you want to jump in, Tatsu. Yeah, sure thing. Um, hey, Steven. Um, great to see another uh, post-PhD doing well in industry. Um, 
so actually it's pretty funny because my, my background is um, very similar to yours. Um, I, I think you said you were imaging while, while you had kids reading or something like that. Mine uh, is basically sub uh, EEG for the imaging medium and then uh, we had kids exercising. So uh, a lot of a lot of similarities there. Um, I ended up landing um, in the in the customer success space. I work at our studio. Um, and of course, you know, I, I have a background in using our studio and and here I am, right? Um, but what um, I found interesting so far from you know here and there as you're answering questions, right? is um, i'm I'm very curious on your perspective on, you know, that transition and like how easy or hard it is, right? For me, I, I think it was very difficult. Um, I, you know, I come from psychology, uh, which traditionally um, kind of all they teach you to do is, is become an academic, right? Um, there isn't a whole lot of help for you as the student who's, you know, um, considering a career in, you know, maybe a, a data uh, related role, right? Which lends really well to the skill set that you're taught. But there isn't any course that that teaches you how to do that transition. There isn't a whole lot of networking events that lends well to that. Um, and at the same time, right? Like I, I think that from the industry side, um, I think people are starting to recognize that. Oh wow! Like people um, that come through the PhD pipeline, they have a lot of what we need. Um, but the issue then becomes, right? From our perspective, we don't know how to phrase those those skill sets, right? To to be able to apply it in a in an interview setting or anything like that. So I just I just like to hear your your kind of thoughts on that. Is it kind of a a failure of the the higher education system, or is it something more that uh, um, you know industry folks could be doing better to identify? That's a that's such a great question, and I do love like anyone who's not familiar with the brain, like the brain uh, neuroscience community. It's like there's a whole like subfield of psychology that's just like, what's your brain look like when you're doing this? And when you're doing this and when you're eating candy and like when you're looking at uh, frogs, um, <laughs> it's like exactly. there's endless, uh, endless opportunities for um, for research. And it, it's really I mean, it's amazing. I mean, there's a lot of amazing research um, and findings from that. But I, you know, I totally I totally feel you. And I'm trying I'm, I, I think my brain um, is scrambled on it uh, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> How do I say like it's such a it's almost like a relationship when you go with a PhD program um, you do feel like you, it's 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 both it's not it's a job but it's like more than a job too there's like it's almost like you have a relationship with the field and you're very invested in the research and you're like it's you're being you're part of the scientific community and I think one of the things that's very jarring about leaving um, a field is you lose that it's all you feel like you're getting divorced or something like that like you're like you're severing that relationship and you're severing that community because it is it is almost two different worlds and so i think for me i identified pretty early on that i wanted to move out and that helped me because i was able to spend a lot of time um talking with people who weren't in the university and building relationships so that when I did transition, um, when graduated, I already knew like, I knew people who were on the other side, so to speak. And so I didn't, even though I felt lonely and I was the first data science hire and like no one knew what a data scientist did and no one like, I also felt like I had a pretty good understanding of business of like, this is what a business, this is what doing data science and business do, doing data in, in a business looks like. Um, so I think that if, if anyone's thinking about transitioning or, or doing something similar, um, I think that's a very, like talking to people and building relationships before that transition can really help, um, make it softer, but like, you wish think, you could have some help, right? <laughs> you wish yeah. you could have, I mean, I had, a, I had a very, very similar experience, like where, when, when you go through a PhD program, they teach you how to learn, right? We, we know how to learn how to learn and we can learn how to, to you know, figure out this whole, this whole getting hired in an industry role sort of thing. And that's exactly what we do, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it would have been nicer, right? If you didn't, you weren't the one that had to actively do all, all of this, this, this networking, 
um, necessarily, right? It would have been nicer if it was just kind of some easier formats for you to kind of plug yourself in. Yeah, I had I had an interview. Um, you know, one of the things that kind of surprised me is I was this biomedical imaging PhD in, in at Vanderbilt in Nashville, and Nashville is like a huge healthcare hub, and I couldn't find a job. I, I like I looked for quite a while, and I couldn't find a job. And I met skepticism. I met I had one interview where they're kind of like, "You sound great." but why would you want to work here? <laughs> and then I had another job that was like, well, we don't really do any imaging stuff. And, you know, I was kind of like, I'm like, I don't, I, it's about the learning. It's about the impact. It's about like, it's not about the imaging, you know, it's just one example. This is just one subset of problems that I'm interested in. Um, and so you do, um, you do have to go through like and intentionally think about branding yourself and think about like, um, I, th I think the biggest thing in industry is you can't get um, you can't get obsessed with the problem. You can't fall you can't fall in love with a problem. Um, it's much it makes your job of finding a job and like fitting in much harder. You have to fall in love with the um, your position in some way, like like your your the way like how you're solving problems. Um, more mm -hmm. of like applying the mindset of a scientist into this business context. I think. Whereas on the other side, like in, in academia, you just fall in love with the problem and you kind of like figure out the methods, you know, to, that, that makes sense and how to get money and all that stuff. So it is, I, I'd say that's the biggest thing, you know, it kind of goes back to that domain question um, that we talked about earlier, where it's like, if you love healthcare, um, yeah, if you fall in love with a particular problem in healthcare, it's harder to pursue that problem across companies um, because there's there's much fewer problem fewer companies who are looking to hire for that one problem yeah sounds like this question hits home for a bunch of people in the chat too so maybe there's people who are willing to talk to others who are going through the same thing but i see step you were also sharing a few tips in the the chat too if you'd want to say those too yeah i mean uh the uh, I, I haven't spoken to a PhD where, you know, things like this don't, don't resonate, right? And um, I've certainly struggled through that myself. It does, it, you, everyone carves their own path. I think, uh, as Tatsu was saying, you just kind of, you learn to learn, you kind of figure it out. And I, I think that the skill sets that everyone's learning in graduate school, no matter what the subject area is, uh, are very helpful in being able to help address that. But uh, you know, my biggest thing, my biggest advice would be, don't be afraid to reach out to people most people are very willing to, to talk to you about what their journey was, no matter where they're at in, in, in their career, whether they have a PhD, whether they don't have a PhD. And once you kind of see that and you start to talk to people, you realize that your, your, uh, your um, uh, room is much bigger, right? There's, there's a lot of people from all walks of life that have moved multiple careers or multiple industries. And so, um, you know, finding that through whether that's your local community, whether that's the data science hangout, whether it's something else, I think that's the number one thing. And then, and then you feel like uh, you, you know you, you find the right people. It is pretty amazing the networking that can be done virtually or <laughs> just on LinkedIn as well. Like sometimes I forget, like oh, I I met these people on LinkedIn first. Like in my head, I feel like I know them so well. Like we had met in person <laughs> at some point. Um, Meredith, I, I see you also had a question in the chat. Would you want to jump in with that one? Sure. I know we're almost out of time, but I was just thinking about what the limitations are between higher education and industry collaborating more. You know, I've, I've seen some really great collaborations, especially it seems like certain departments within any university do a really nice job connecting with industry and the community. Um, but it's, I don't know if it's discipline specific or I'm curious to see, hear what people's thoughts are about the limitations of collaboration. I think my experience at Vanderbilt, I saw a lot more industry collaborations on the engineering disciplines than I did in like psychology, for example, or education. I saw quite a few collaborations with like uh, public institutions. So, you know, whether I know at Vanderbilt, they had like these um, big, big surveys and big studies that the, the university would do in partnership with the state department of education, um, policy and analysis and that type of stuff. Um, 
And then in the biomedical engineering um, program, it seemed like there were a lot of grants, you know, a lot of, a lot of work um, was stemmed by grants uh, that they would get from industry partners. Um, and in fact, like I think Google invested a bunch of money into um, uh, one of the labs we worked with at, at Vanderbilt. So it's a great question though. I think, I think more, more is better for sure. Just, it, just from a training and opportunity perspective. Steven, I know we're a little bit over. There's, I think, two more questions, if that's okay, or do you have to run? Yeah, nope, that's fine. Okay, awesome. This is awesome. Uh, by, the, by the way, this is like the best, this is the best Zoom thing I've been a part of in probably the last year. This is awesome. Like this, this hanging out. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Uh, Thank you all for making it what it is. Um, Ethan, I, I see you had another question a bit earlier in the chat, and I can't find it. So I'm going to pull you, pull you in and ask that. Oh, you right, sorry. Um, there you are. Yeah, I just want, just want to ask because um, you've worked with uh, both data engineers and data scientists. Um, what are the things that, what is your, first of all, what is your point of view of data scientists and what do you think they should do more and what do you think they should do less? Because we oftentimes hear this um, sort of like, um, conversations between data engineer and data scientist um, that, you know, uh, the, the perception of, uh, of both roles and um, what is your peer point of view on that? Yeah, so um, I would say for data practitioners in general, and this goes for analysts and scientists, um, when I was managing the team at Amuda, um, one thing I found myself saying to our data scientists a lot was like, how can we simplify it? Like simplify, simplify like things um, because in the business context, and again, we're a smaller company. We weren't building like, in a, we weren't building like models, right? That had to like accommodate a bunch of stuff. Um, we were building more of just data products and dashboards and scores and things like that for for our business consumers. But having the you can't I can't overstate the value of having transparent logic for end users. And we talk a lot about like you hear about explainability um, in the context of like neural networks, but the same is true for anything like any function that like takes input data and then like outputs something. Uh, the more explainable that is, the more likely it's going to be adopted um, and by the business user. And so like if you can get the same if you can get the same output from log logarithmic regression that you can from like some Bayesian model like. Go with logarithmic regression. So that's kind of cliche, I think, at this point, but um, I've seen it in practice and it, it has a big effect. Um, the other thing I would say is just always thinking with an eye to deployment, like, you know, can we do this? What's the simplest way we can do this and so, uh, so that we can get it in production as quickly as possible? So can we do this as a SQL statement? Like that was a, a lot of times the decision that we had to make on the Muta team. Like, can this be a SQL statement? Um, that produces a table that can be read in, or does it need to be some Python like Lambda function that runs on a schedule? Because that additional complexity is, um, it compounds as the system grows. So uh, the more you can kind of keep things simple, um, the best, the better. Yeah, uh, reminds me of a meme about like data science and then being unmasked is actually just it fails underneath. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> and I would say always do the if else if you can. Uh, you can still call yourself data scientist. Yeah, I mean, they do it in science too, right? Like you never want to look at an actual like professor's code. Um, I would guess just read the paper, um, read, get the get the insights. Don't worry about what's underneath. Yeah, but to be fair, the XG boost is also just fancy if else. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Olivia, I see you also had a comment uh, around building trust in data or lightly processed data. Do you want to jump in and and add any context to that? Um, sure. So that that's kind of part of my job right now. I'm I'm doing like data engineering by proxy, working on data integration, and and it's very very complicated. But that's part of my challenge is making sure that we can build trust in our data and our lightly processed data and our consumable data. Um, and, you know, doing that is all new to me. 
change data capture and business rule externalization. Can you talk anything about that? Yeah, so one of the light bulb moments for me um, was uh, at leading the data team at Amuda and like starting to grow the system was reading a book called um, Data Management at Scale. It's very like theoretical, um, but one of the principles is this idea of domain-driven design, which is as data comes in um, to your system, <clears throat> you don't wanna build just like a big black box where it's like, again, it's a kind of explainability, right? So when data comes in from you know, the marketing team and the sales team and the um, customer success team, you don't want to just like merge it into one like super, super, super table and then like expose it. You want to try and set up like interfaces where it's like, all right, here's the lightly processed marketing data. Here's the lightly processed sales data. Here's the lightly processed customer success data and kind of keep some, um, keep some, you want to track the lineage, right? So that you know, like, hey, this is coming from here. And then if someone from marketing or sales or product comes in, they don't have to ask like, where does this come from? Like, where's this marketing? You know, I'm looking at sales data, but I'm getting all this extra marketing data with it. What I found is that um, the more you can do that, the more people can like uh, feel, feel ownership over it. I, we did this one thing at Amuda where we exposed Salesforce, which is our customer relationship management platform. It has like all of our customer lists and stuff in it. Um, Salesforce data comes into the warehouse, then it gets exposed in our, our BI tool looker. And I, there was this weird thing where the person who managed Salesforce would look at numbers and looker and they would be like, I don't know what these are. <laughs> like they wouldn't, they didn't feel ownership over it simply because it was like going through our pipes. And so we re-architected things and tried to keep it much more like domain oriented and they that had the positive effect of like making them feel more ownership over it because they would go and they look at looker and they look at salesforce and be like okay this matches up like and they, they kind of go and do that um and that sort of building trust and building familiarity with the data is is um is really hard but i think it's it's easier uh if you can keep things separate and lightly processed um, and, and just have good documentation and clarity, but it's, it's a challenge. I think it's probably one of the biggest challenges in data management. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stephen, for jumping on and sharing your experience with us. And, and thank you all for asking all these amazing questions too. I just wanted to see Stephen, what's the best way to get in touch with you if people have follow-up questions or want to connect? Is it LinkedIn? Or uh, yeah, LinkedIn is good. I have a Twitter account. I try, um, Twitter kind of scares me and I don't want to get sucked in. Um, so I, I, I don't post on that too much, but, um, LinkedIn, LinkedIn is good. I started writing more this year. And so feel free to, to subscribe to that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I really appreciate all the, the time, everybody. This is awesome. Thank no you questions. so much. And if you want to continue any of the conversations from today, I'll put the LinkedIn group in the chat too. And feel free to start your own discussions there. I usually share a few of the helpful links there too. Thanks all. Have a great rest of the day.